Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today, we're joined by Steve Kennard, Director of Bitcoin Analytics at the Texas Blockchain Council, formerly the Vice President of Energy Financial Services at BOK Financial. Steve digs into the TBC's liaison role between government and industry, proof of work versus proof of stake, and combating FUD. This podcast is presented ad-free by Compass Mining, the largest marketplace for Bitcoin mining. Check out compassmining.io today if you want to buy, sell, or host an ASIC. And now, onto the show. Steve, thanks so much for joining us on the Compass Podcast. Really excited for this conversation. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Well, I'm looking forward to it and I've uh, been a fan of the show for quite a while. So it's pretty neat to be on it as well. Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, it's fun to have someone who's been listening onto the podcast. Typically, we we do have a lot of that, but they don't tell me they're listening to it. They just like, maybe <laughs> make a sly reference about like disagreeing with someone who's been on the podcast and then right, try right. to get an invite on later, which I'm totally <laughs> for. Like, I actually love the, the battle royals, if you will. Um, but this is a pretty great uh, entry. Uh, TBC, though, that you guys have made so many headways uh, this year, and then you're joining as a, a mining analyst. So maybe we can actually start off with like yourself and Bitcoin and then moving into your role at TBC, because what you guys are doing uh, is very, very important for the political landscape and very important for Texas. Uh, so we're thankful that we've had Lee on the show a few times, and we're also thankful to sponsor uh, the Texas Blockchain Council. But we'll, we'll kick off with uh, your personal story in Bitcoin. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Will. It's it's been a good partnership, Texas Blockchain Council and Compass, and look forward to continuing to build that. I think for me, it all kind of starts March of 2020. I think there are a lot of people in that boat. You know, I was working in corporate finance, focused on oil and gas. That's the the background in terms of my professional career. I was at an operating company in Houston for about five years um, as a manager of finance, and then I came over to a bank working on. On providing uh, revolving lines of credit to to oil and gas operators and midstream operators, and so March of 2020 hits, and uh, you know, embarrassingly, I said, "Well, we'll never be sent home from the office," and and then we were, and I said, "Well, this will be one or two weeks, and it'll all be over," and so that turned into three and four, and you know, I found myself at home with a lot more time to think about things, and I give my wife credit, and this is one of the many reasons I love her. When, when Bitcoin went under 10,000, she said, hey, we should probably buy some of this. And embarrassingly, I wasn't so quick, as quick to listen as I should have been. <laughs> so that kind of lit a fire under me to explore it a little bit, or at least be sufficiently educated to articulate why I didn't think it was a viable technology. Of course, now I've completely 180 and and I'm really excited to be focused on Bitcoin. So I I started sort of seeking out educational materials and I think the way I found my way into Bitcoin is a little bit different than most because it was really through my energy background and that's what pulled me into it. I would say as I started to read about it there were really two resources at the time that that started to to pull me in more and more. And w- one of them was the Compass Mining podcast. And the other was a podcast that uh, that Marty Bent was doing of the, not Tales from the Crypt, but he was doing a podcast at the time called the Gamcast. It was all about oil and gas and Bitcoin mining. And I'll say when I first heard that, I was very skeptical of the idea of Bitcoin mining in the oil field. But I can tell you from my own personal experience I know how challenging it can be to have stranded gas and just what a pain that is to the operation. So I knew right away, if this can solve that problem, the implications are profound. And so that sort of pulled me into the to the proverbial rabbit hole, <laughs> if you will. So you fast forward, you know, six months, eight months from there into 2021, and you know. It just so happens I live down the street from Lee Bratcher, the president of the Texas Blockchain Council. So I was I was an early member. It was an avenue for me to explore this, network with other like-minded individuals. But I was kind of doing it from afar, just comfortable in my job. It wasn't really until the second half of 2021 that I think I'd had enough time to stew on it, think through it, read a lot more, interact with people carry out a little more what I would call due diligence. And I finally bit the bullet, bought an S19 through through Compass actually, and just started home mining. And as soon as I fired that thing up, 
I felt the heat coming off of it. I just felt this like, (laughs) this is what I'm going to be doing (laughs) from here on out. And alongside that, I've had a number of discussions and I'm working on on some different projects and, and kind of larger scale type implications. And I've talked to a number of oil and gas companies and um, I think the oil field is coming to this in a big way. And I wanted to be a part of that. And so I, I started to explore kind of what avenue makes sense and where can I contribute the most. And that's where I thought of Lee and the Texas Blockchain Council, because I'm right down the road from Lee and I are here in Dallas. Um, and I just figured, you know, I'd give him a call and just say, Lee, I, I think, you know, the time is right. I think the TBC is doing really important work to build the industry up, to professionalize the industry and engage with all the different stakeholders. And I think it makes a lot of sense to have someone with a corporate finance, a banking background and some oil and gas experience as the the kind of relationship between those industries and Bitcoin mining continues to expand. And I was just fortunate enough. He said, you know, I agree with you. Let's do it. (laughs) And so it was like zero to 100 miles an hour real fast put in my two weeks notice. Um, and so I started just last week kind of drinking from the fire hose, but all good things, very exciting. Um, and the timing is great too, because I can say this weekend I was, I was at Bitcoin day in Oklahoma city. And it's just awesome to see how the industry is being built up and there's more and more professionals coming to it and a lot of interest. And tomorrow, I think you and I both are probably headed to Houston for this empower Bitcoin conference. And, you know, that's coming on the heels of an announcement from Exxon Mobil that they're mining Bitcoin. And when I started going down this rabbit hole, if if I had said, hey, I think Exxon Mobil will be mining Bitcoin, disclosing that publicly in less than two years, that would have been a laughable, you know, claim mm-hmm. to make. And so it just goes to show how fast this is moving, the opportunity. And, and ultimately, that's where I said, I, I got to make a jump and just do everything I can to to help this. And so in in the near term, one of the focuses for me, at least in text at the Texas blockchain council is, is going to be to, to help gather data. And my title is director of Bitcoin mining analytics. And so kind of within that title, um, you know, it's self-evident there's a focus on data collection. And so we, we have a tremendous membership. I think more and more of the industry is doing a great job of interacting with the public, interacting with lawmakers and, and stakeholders of all, you know, of all backgrounds. Um, but the TBC can make a bigger contribution there. And so that's, that's where I'm going to focus in the near term is how do we effectively communicate around the jobs that are being created, the amazing, you know, increase in tax revenues that you're seeing and in rural communities that have struggled, you know, particularly through COVID. Um, So there's a really positive, you know, powerful story to be told there with data. And and I'm going to be working to help, you know, collect that data as a third party working with various industry participants to, to get you know, good data, communicate it clearly and make it available so that we can combat a lot of the falsehoods that are, that are being spread. And I think just misunderstanding. Talk about validation for starting a new job, ExxonMobil jumping into Bitcoin mining, right? When uh, you jump in with TBC, it's pretty, pretty good timing. (laughs) Yeah, It literally doesn't get any bigger than that. (laughs) No, it doesn't. It really doesn't. (laughs) It was, uh, yeah, (laughs) it probably felt pretty good, didn't it? Uh, Tell me more about the role though, because you brought up a few things that are really interesting to me from coming from uh, a, a tech reporting background and a Bitcoin background and having worked with a lot of people in the space who do data analytics, do research. I mean, I talk with the team at Coinmetrics. We're having them on the show soon again. Talk Great. with people at Galaxy Digital who seed invested in us uh, alongside CoinShares as well. They're all sort of in this Bitcoin mining data analytics game. It's really, really hard, but it matters a lot, especially for someone who's in public relations like TBC. Uh, could you describe to the audience a little bit more what is the goal of your position and what are you going to do with the data that you find? Uh, who's the audience for that data? Sure. So I think I think a good example that that will probably be a first area of focus is gauging and and how do we communicate around expectations for growth. So there's already been an enormous amount of hash rate built out in Texas, and there's a lot more coming. Our expectation at a high level right now is that by the end of 2023, 
the hash rate in Texas will roughly triple, which is a pretty tremendous amount of growth. But I think more importantly, as we start to interact with industry participants, you know, how do we narrow that down a little bit, drill down to substantiate those expectations more and kind of come up with ranges of potential outcomes. So we have that ballpark figure from kind of informal interaction that we've had with a number of people. But what we want to do is get a little bit deeper with, with key participants like a compass to be able to, you know, roll out kind of what is the proper format or what's a reasonable way to to come up with these forecasts. And then from that base, you can start to talk about follow-on impacts like job creation and tax revenue. And so with that focus on placing on job creation and tax revenue, you can probably figure out that the the first audience that we'll have in mind is is really legislators. Um, because we do a lot of work to engage with the legislature here in Texas and provide good, you know, clear information to inform those decisions. And, and then also there's ERCOT, which is the, you know, Electricity Reliability Council of Texas, primary grid operator. And we are going to be working in the coming weeks to apply as an adjunct member, a non-voting member of ERCOT, And I think we'll be the only non-voting member kind of industry association type of entity because this is such a new kind of relationship between ERCOT and external operators that that just goes to show you we're going to be sort of spearheading this effort to engage as a non-voting member, as as a resource, really, not as somebody trying to, you know, directly influence uh, the the, um, the votes that take place. And so I think that'll be a meaningful venue. And naturally, they're going to want to know sort of wh- where is this information coming from? How has it been vetted? So we want to serve as a, a little bit more of a centralized venue for people to provide these kinds of forward-looking, you know, forecasts and expectations and and, and start to, to, to iterate around that. I don't think there's ever going to be just the one, well, by 2023, it's going to triple. I mean, it'll evolve over time with market conditions, availability of capital, which is a big, that's a bottleneck right now. And of course, the supply chain. So those are all, those are all pieces that we'll be, you know, updating along the way. I don't know if that's, you know, monthly, quarterly, we're, we're having those discussions in real time. You know, how do we, communicate this and then how do we update it and and change it accordingly because it is going to change um, but there there has been I think sort of a lack of of a of an industry uh, voice that that's directly interacting with the the stakeholders at a place like ERCOT or the government of Texas that are making these decisions and then keeping that discussion ongoing so not not kind of like a one-time report but a continuous way to um, to provide valuable information that that's, that's a near term one that we're going to try to work through. And, and in terms of the validation that you asked for, I I think we learn as we go. I mean, I I can tell you, I've only been in a week. I've been looking around uh, as much as I can. And there, there's not a lot of like public templates. There's not a lot of, you know, someone's kind of already done this for you. We're so much in the Bitcoin mining industries, at most just a few years old, right? So we're sort of, we're building it up. I think that's what excites me so much about it. You know, we get to really have a big say in, in the direction of, of this conversation. And there's no better place than Texas to lead because we already see so much development coming here. We have a tremendous resource just within the existing TBC membership and that membership's growing every day of professionals that can inform this process. And, and I welcome that. I mean, I, I want, you know, differing opinions, new opinions, and all different kinds of, of, uh, of players and stakeholders within the industry to weigh in. That's what we're here for, is to provide that venue for that important discussion. Totally. And let's move over the conversation over to talk about oil and gas, which obviously you have a deep background in and then also the corporate side. And getting those two pieces to talk together, that is Bitcoin miners who are moving into Texas and oil and gas, which is like a, a very standard industry that is an incumbent industry in Texas most people know about. And getting those two sides to talk has necessarily been like, it's a new thing right now. 
Yeah. But it, it almost feels like old hat because of how many people have been talking about it this last year, right? <laughs> yeah. Like so many conversations have been about stranded gas, Bitcoin mining, or, you know, plopping a Bitcoin mine somewhere out in East Texas or West Texas. Uh, but that doesn't mean like a large part of this industry, the oil and gas industry, knows anything about Bitcoin mining. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on where the oil and gas industry in Texas is at with Bitcoin mining. Is is the conversation as advanced as most people think it is, or is this industry still just beginning to grapple with what Bitcoin mining could be? It's more the latter and the just beginning to grapple. I think we're reaching an inflection point where things start to transition from an exploratory like a discussion based kind of thing into an actionable like investment decision. I think it's worth noting that you know the the ExxonMobil announcement was huge but something in there that's important too is they they started with a focus in North Dakota and I think the reason for that is that the stranded gas problem is really acute in North Dakota it's just it's very remote and the economics underpinning most of the investment decisions for operators are based on oil production. So the, the, the gas is kind of a, an ancillary product. That, that's not 100% of the time, but in, in general, the reason there is so much flared gas is because investment decisions are made with the assumption that the return on the gas will be zero. And so it makes sense that these large operators, as they kind of position with their ESG mandates, would focus on on that region. Now it's starting to shift to Texas. As you mentioned, there's been a lot of talk. There's also a lot of flaring in West Texas. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, that that is going to continue to drive headlines. But I, I, I think the inflection point we're going to start to reach is operators will start to use Bitcoin mining to ameliorate this, this ESG issue. And, and, and beyond that, I'll say is, is having been involved in the industry, nobody likes to flare gas. That's universally, you know, something we all want to eliminate. And so it's such a, it, it, it's such a no brainer that I think this, the, the only reason it's been delayed is because there's, there's sort of a hesitance attached around anytime you just say Bitcoin, right? People kind of take a step back and it's been amazing to watch that completely evolve and change over the past two years. I think because so many operators are focused now on, on, on telling that ESG story. So even though it made economic sense and it was maybe just the right thing to do, ultimately we needed a little bit of an impetus to, for action to be taken. And that just so happened to be the, the ESG story. But the more exciting thing to me, Will, is you know if you think about this, Oil and gas operators, you know, they they have a fiduciary duty to monetize those assets as effectively as possible. And over time, I think it's inevitable that as they familiarize themselves with the flexibility that Bitcoin mining brings as a buyer of first and last resort for energy, it, it's just it's going to grow very rapidly. I'm I'm confident within five years, almost every large operator and you know, significant private equity firm in the space will have a quote Bitcoin guy that that's on call. And I'm not about to say that every well is going to have a Bitcoin mine on it. That's not what I think. It's it's not a like a panacea 100% of the time. But I do think that within the next couple of years, when an investment decision is made, one of this kind of standard questions that everyone goes through is, does it make sense to incorporate a Bitcoin mine when we drill this well, right? And it's amazing to think about that because as we've discussed, this was like a joke two years ago. It was, it was hard to really get anyone to engage with it seriously outside of, you know, kind of the, like the podcast world. But now we're going to this in in Houston and it's, it's all kinds of big names. I think people are taking it very seriously. And the natural next step from there is the companies are going to hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet. I think right now, I suspect, I don't know this to be true, but I suspect that ExxonMobil probably doesn't have any Bitcoin yet in, in, in custody. But as, as the economics around this and the, the important role that it plays in the value chain become more evident, I think the oil and gas industry is the natural venue, beyond Bitcoin mining, of course, is the natural venue for Bitcoin on the balance sheet to become normalized, just sort of a universal 
practice where I, I do envision a future not far from now where if an oil and gas operator doesn't have some Bitcoin on their balance sheet, they'll actually get questions of why don't you? Like, have you have you really done the proper due diligence to be sure that there's not a value proposition from incorporating Bitcoin mining to be an effective fiduciary for your investors? And and again, I don't say 100 percent of all companies will, but I do think it will increasingly become sort of a base question of, hey, we notice you're not holding any Bitcoin. Why not? You know, what what analysis went into determining that that's not a valuable you know, a value driver for the company. And and that's what got me excited. That's what had me calling Lee saying, wow, I, I, I see something really big coming here. It's a it's a positive for the industry. It's a positive for Texas. It, it's it's rare you find such a win-win. And right now we're we're hearing so much discussion around the importance of energy security. And often one of the bottlenecks in bringing more oil production to market can be dealing with gas production. And so this is this is something that can serve as another kind of arrow in the quiver, if you will, to deal with that challenge. It doesn't solve all our problems. Nothing does. But we should avail ourselves of this opportunity. And it's exciting to see the industry, you know, embrace it. And, um, you know, this this event in Houston is also going to play host to, to Senator Cruz and Congressman Sessions from from Texas. And so you're seeing, you know, political uh, stakeholders at the highest levels actively encouraging this and looking for ways to partner with the industry to to normalize this and 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 make Texas a leader. So it's it's an exciting time to be working on it. Yeah, you said a few things in that uh just head turning at the very least and uh, one of them being bitcoin these uh oil and gas companies are probably not holding bitcoin in their balance sheet yet, but I doubt probably I do know in that the near to be future, true, but I doubt it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I think that We'll be surprised, just like we were surprised the last two weeks with Exxon jumping in the game. I think we'll be surprised to see it. more and more companies do that soon here. But let's turn to, uh, to ERCOT itself, which you guys are having a very important and fundamental role with now. You said that, that non-voting, but member of the body itself. Uh, just for listeners, if you could give us like, like the quick two-second recap of what ERCOT does. But how are you guys lobbying with ERCOT or working with ERCOT to... Uh, increase the security of the Texas grid, and then also bring Bitcoin mining into that conversation. And I know you've only been at uh, TBC for a week, but what have the conversations <laughs> been like with TBC and ERCOT? Or what, what are your expectations going into that conversation about bringing Bitcoin into ERCOT? Sure. I'd say my expectations you know, at a high level are very positive. I think ERCOT's going to be a great partner for us. So for the listeners, ERCOT, the Electricity Reliability Council of Texas, they are um, they are the agency that for most of the state, you know, te- Texas is unique. I should take a step back. Texas is unique in that we essentially as a state have our own grid. Most other states are part of larger grid systems that are interconnected to other states and they share power in a more kind of kind of a national scale uh, network. Texas has this sort of standalone system. And one of the positives is that it allows, in, in my opinion, for more effective engagement with them because they're just focused on Texas. Um, and what they've also been focused on in past, you know, the more, more recent years is encouraging uh, market-based incentives to, to strengthen the grid. And, and one of the most important things that they uh, that they facilitate is what's called demand response, which is different large consumers uh, within the system that can participate in the controlled load resources program, this demand response. And essentially, if the demand on the grid is is increasing rapidly and potentially exceeding the supply at a point in time, it's a kind of a standby uh, capacity that can be powered down. And there's an economic incentive that comes with that to offset some of the costs related to powering down. But what makes Bitcoin mining such a great partner for that program is that it can be powered down 
much, much quicker and with less economic ramifications than most other industries. You know, if you have a big steel mill, you can't just completely turn it off. I mean, you can, but it's highly disruptive and the costs are prohibitive to have that be an ongoing part of your business plan. Whereas most of the major miners in Texas have completely embraced this and have actively done that. And some of the recent, you know, winter uh, uh, events that we've had where demand has gone up and they were able to strengthen the grid by powering down and, and allowing, uh, you know, some of that electricity to, to be rerouted to end users uh, that, that otherwise wouldn't have been available. Um, the other part of that, I, I, I want to make sure I'm clear, we're, we're in the process of applying to be an adjunct non-voting member that's subject to the approval of, of the ERCOP board. Um, I, I haven't been directly involved, but I can, I can say that, that so far, uh, you know, the, the sort of interactions that I'm aware of with our have all been very positive. I think the governor of Texas has been clear. We, we want to encourage more Bitcoin miners to come to the state, but as the industry scales and participates in this demand response program, it requires more thoughtful planning. And so as part of that, ERCOT is launching what they're calling the large flexible load task force, which I think is a great idea to, to have a designated venue to discuss these issues in a constructive way so that we make sure that, that as we bring you know, these jobs, additional tax revenue and, and significant investment in energy infrastructure, that we do it in a way that delivers on that promise of strengthening the grid. And, and that's, that's where ERCOT, ERCOT's role is critical. Essentially, they serve as sort of an, an in-between between, between uh, energy consumers and the producers to make sure that the system is in balance. If it gets out of balance, that can cause parts of the grid to go down. And so when you have significant consumers like a Bitcoin mine, uh, it just requires uh, more constant and more sophisticated communication so that as consumption moves up and down, as dictated by different economic conditions, there aren't ramifications to that kind of delicate balance of the grid. Because anytime we get out of balance, it's, that's not good, whether demand outstrips supply or supply outstrips demand. So if a big mine goes, goes off and, and demand comes, comes way down, you're out of balance. And, and, and that's just one example. And there's numerous ways that the industry can sort of broaden the way we communicate with ERCOT as a partner and ensuring that balance. And so I think the creation of that task force is a great example of, you know, it's, it's not some big public thing. It's, there's nothing combative about it at all. It, it's it's really like an invitation, I would say, to the industry um, to to communicate and and uh, and work alongside ERCOT to ensure that we're growing as an industry responsibly. And I think everybody wants that. Uh, and and frankly, it's encouraging to see that um, that you know this is this is a government entity that is 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 taking action to to improve and get ahead of that growth. Right. They've they've kind of foreseen potential issues and said, you know, let, let's find a way to fix this so that we can continue to scale the industry up and, and make Texas a leader. Um, so there'll, there'll be more news around that task force. That's something that the TBC really wants to to be involved in and um, and and represent smaller industry players that probably aren't going to be ERCOT members. You know, but the aggregate um, impact that a number of smaller miners can have is is still meaningful, and so we we have a membership that 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 are smaller miners as well, and we can advocate and communicate on their behalf. And then, of course, we have the larger miners, which may very well uh, be members of ERCOT themselves, and and then that's that's a productive partnership as well. We we welcome and encourage you know each individual company to to take the path that makes the most sense for them. But, but in any, in any event, the TBC, I think is, is playing a pretty unique role that to my knowledge, no other state has, um, because we have ERCOT, it's, it's unique to Texas. And so we are uniquely, you know, stepping up to, to really create this new forum for Bitcoin miners to communicate with stakeholders. And it's, it's another differentiator for Texas that, that makes us such a strong, you know, pitch for more companies to invest here, grow here, and bring more jobs. I appreciate the the fact correction there on the on the voting membership. Hopefully, that passes. We'll be 
watching anxiously. Moving to um, different parts of the industry right now, though, f- there's a lot of FUD out there. Like, there's mm-hmm. a lot mm-hmm. of FUD out there. Uh, and there's a lot of conversations that need to happen with regular people who this isn't part of their normal day-to-day business and with people who are against the industry just outright, whether that be politicians or those in like the ESG camp itself. Right. I'm curious to get your take. What are the hot hitting topics out of that, you know, sp- sp- I don't know what the correct word would be, but there's like a huge list of FUD items you can tackle. What are the top things you guys are looking at at TBC and then for your uh, role specifically interested because Bitcoin mining is such a heavy topic right now. Uh, and you're basically in the driver's seat for engaging in that conversation. That, that's right. There's a lot of different angles. There seem to be more each, each passing day. Um, and one area that, that we'll be focusing on in the near term is I, I think one of the, one of the damaging, you know, FUD items that's out there is that proof of stake is essentially the same as proof of work. Therefore, if proof of stake consumes little to no energy purportedly, um, why have proof of work at all, right? That, that's kind of the line, the line of, of, of reasoning. And I don't think that that, that question can be effectively uh, addressed via Twitter and, and, and headlines. And so our, our effort is going to be around building out a little more database materials and explanation, particularly for legislators, but for the public at large too, to try to help them understand some key differences. And the angle there, Will, is, is not an anti-proof of stake. Uh, you know, it's, I, I believe in a, in a free market and in a, in a free country. So we can have proof of stake, but we want to make sure that key decision makers and, and the public at large appreciates that these are fundamentally two different systems with different value propositions. Um, and the, 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 the most important thing I want to try to communicate with proof of work is for people to understand what it means to be truly decentralized. I think that word's being applied to a lot of different things. And at the end of the day, Bitcoin has proven as the largest proof of work protocol in the world that this is this is a system that works to secure a decentralized protocol that that allows for peer to peer permissionless transactions and that's a really powerful kind of zero to one innovation that has real implications for for human rights for for delivering sound money to people that haven't had that available to them um, and then also for strengthening the infrastructure in a, in a place like Texas and in a proof of stake system that, 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 that's not possible to the same degree that Bitcoin offers, um, through proof of work. And so we want to help, you know, delineate that. And again, it's not in an anti proof of stake. Uh, it's simply to make sure that people can appreciate that when weighing pros and cons and strengths and weaknesses, these are not interchangeable uh, consensus mechanisms. Um, and uh, that seems to be widely misunderstood, uh, sometimes deliberately, it seems, but, but often to the, to the uninitiated, if you will, it's easy to say, well, you know, all of these cryptos are the same thing. And if this one uses you know, 0.01% of the energy per transaction of Bitcoin, then, then we should use that one. At the end of the day, the importance of Bitcoin is that it is the most de- decentralized, the most liquid, the largest. And as a function of having the largest uh, amount of proof of work hash rate, it's the most secure. It's the most secure place uh, as a store of value. And and so that's going to take, I think, um, an evolution over time of materials. Different people will want to go deeper into that than others and understand, you know, how, how does the SHA-256, you know, work or what is the difficulty adjustment? And, and, and others won't need to go that, that deep, but we want to invite people to, to dig a little deeper than just the headlines to understand the, the value proposition of, um, of these decentralized systems and that there there's a range of decentralization and the most decentralized is Bitcoin. So if that's important, and I would say that it is 
it is very important, um, then Bitcoin kind of stands apart from, from all others. And it's, it stands apart as a function of proof of work, which in turn is as a function of its energy consumption. And if we communicate this effectively, I think people will come to appreciate that the energy consumption is a good thing. It's a positive. It secures the network. It secures the value that you're storing there. And, and that's important because the, the answer is not to eliminate the, the energy consumption. It's to appreciate the value that it's delivering for society. And there's some work to be done around communicating that more effectively. And, and there are other organizations we'll be working with as well. I should say we're, we're far from alone. We're, we're working in partnership with, you know, people at, at the, at the national level um, and in other States as well, because we're all partners and, and building this out. And I think, you know, the more people that embrace Bitcoin mining, even outside of Texas, that's still good for Texas. Um, so how that ultimately plays out, I think remains to be seen as, as you've pointed out, I've, I've been at this for, uh, for about a week now. Um, but it is an area of focus. It's something, um, we want to address as soon as possible and kind of actively start to work on, on publishing materials to address that, that particular concern that maybe hasn't been as front and center as say carbon emissions, you know, I think there are a number of organizations that we may we may work with, but that that issue is 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 being um, is being talked about all of the time. It it seems to be like a little a little easier, if you will, is is the assumption this base assumption that proof of work and proof of stake are interchangeable, right? Um, so that that's an example. There will be other you know other uh, issues around FUD that we'll be addressing. I'm sure we have a growing membership. Well, welcome feedback or concerns from anyone, but that is the priority in in the near term. Kind of alongside this ERCOT work is communicating the the value proposition of Bitcoin and why Bitcoin is unique, and Bitcoin is kind of in a, in a class of its own, if you will. Same line of questioning and, and just to uh, close the conversation here as well. What can Bitcoiners do to improve Bitcoin's brand? Uh, there's been a lot of attacks in mainstream media and I don't think that anyone can just brush those off and say they don't matter because they do. People, they have their opinions and a lot of times they base them based on cursing, uh, cursory readings of headlines. So right. What can Bitcoiners do? What can groups like TBC do? What can industry uh, firms like Compass do to help bolster Bitcoin's brand? Sure, it's a great question, and and I think the the simple short answer I would get is let's not allow ourselves to be branded as being against something, whether it's against ESG or against altcoins or you know a, a, against um, government as a whole. I, I don't think the right approach for Bitcoiners as a community is to, uh, is to identify around being opposition, but rather be, that's not the reality. I mean, I've, I've, as I said, I was just in Oklahoma this weekend, um, at Bitcoin day, we're going to Houston and the more events that I go to, this is a community of builders. It, it, it's a positive story, not something in opposition to something else. Uh, and and I think that's that's really the tack we should take as a community is 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 less angst and more focus on the incredible value that Bitcoin brings to society. And the the, the two most obvious to me, number one, particularly in Texas, is that this does strengthen our grid. We have seen, you know, in recent years that there, there is a need to improve that. And B Bitcoin provides a solution that's private sector that creates jobs, increases tax revenue, is a win-win-win, um, and is an all of the above energy security solution. And as a, as a buyer of first and last resort for, for energy, inherently more, um, uh, you know, volatile or uh, disrupted energy sources like 
wind and solar benefit from that j- just by by definition and so i think as we you know communicate that more effectively people can appreciate it because it's it's not about well what percent of renewables are you using today i understand that's the question everyone has it's a little bit more fundamentally the design of the technology will drive investment to renewables whether or not we want that like that that's the natural trajectory of it because it's going to seek out stranded um, resources uh, where the marginal cost of production is lowest. And that's that's what those two sources bring. And then alongside that, building up uh, other sources, resources that, that contribute to the baseload energy is a positive for energy security. So I view it as a positive across the board. Then the other examples on the human rights front, I, I really don't think people appreciate this. And this is maybe more of, an, of a United States issue if people haven't traveled. You know, I've, I've lived abroad and, and and, and interacted, uh, you know, with other with other cultures with different experiences. When I was in in college, I studied in Argentina, and it really had an impact on me because we don't appreciate what it's like to go through a real hyperinflation. We're getting a taste right now, but this is nothing. And in Argentina, you know, the what they went through in two thousand one was a situation where you know one week they were pegged one to one with the dollar, and a week later it was ten to one. I don't know if those are exactly the numbers, but it was along that scale of, of loss of value. Uh, and so it's, it's no wonder that Strike recently uh, launched in Argentina. It's, it's a logical country to bring Bitcoin to because they've had experience with repeated hyperinflation events. And I think it's really unique that as a Bitcoin mining community in Texas, we're securing the network. For people in Argentina, for people in Nigeria, you know, the uptake of Bitcoin is often highest in countries that have suffered the most through hyperinflation and abuse at the hands of of often corrupt governments. And they had no option to offset that until Bitcoin came along. And as we discussed before, there's all these other projects trying to position themselves as the best solution but Bitcoin is the biggest proof of work network, the most liquid and the most secure. And so if people can appreciate the real human impact here, I think we will start to move beyond the more, you know, the vitriol that we're, <laughs> we're hung up on right now, where it's just negativity from all, from all sides. And, and often our social media lives kind of rewards the loudest and the most negative voice, right? And so the role of the TBC is to be a little more measured, a little more fact-based, you know, data-based, um, and engage in a longer form discussion where we can just lay out the facts that the reality is that the net impact of Bitcoin on humanity is is positive it, without a, without question it's it's a net positive for humanity on a number of fronts and i just gave two two examples of that uh, you know unfortunately it's just hard to wrap that up into a short tweet that we can all <laughs> that we that we can just that we can just roll out but i'm i'm excited to engage in that i would encourage bitcoiners to focus on the positive and not the negative of 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 other protocols or the negative of, you know, the, the ESG mandates or whatever it may be. It's just that inherently humanity all over the world is benefiting from the value that Bitcoin delivers. And anyone can be a part of that. As you, mm-hmm. uh, as you well know, uh, you know, anyone can, can mine Bitcoin. Anyone can own Bitcoin. I think that's, that's a phenomenal advancement. Um, you know, for, for humankind. And, uh, the last thing I would say is if you've never put your hand on a miner, go, go do that. <laughs> find, <laughs> find a, find a miner friend, take a tour at a facility. Cause once you get up close and you hear it and you really, mm-hmm. you, you feel the heat, it, 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 it's, it, it really makes it real. It, it, ch- it changes you, I think in a way that, um, often, you know, people don't expect, I've heard a few people tell me that, that, you know, once I saw this in person, it, it really made me appreciate, you know, what a what a tremendous amount of work goes into Bitcoin mining and mm-hmm. and just the real, you know, the man hours, the effort it takes to do it. And that this is it's a real industry. It's growing. And the opportunity for Texas is enormous. 
and we need to lead and we we are going to lead no, definitely agree with you. Go buy a miner. Uh, that's what we do at Compass. So yeah. a little yeah. shill there. I'll, I'll plug that. Appreciate it's it. It's a good shill. <laughs> I, I strongly agree with it. And um, it's pretty cool the first time those mm-hmm. uh, those first sats hit your wallet. You're, <laughs> you know, I'm sitting oh, there addictive. on my cell yeah. phone waiting for the transaction to confirm. And it's like, wow, it doesn't get yeah. any more real than that. So it's a very cool feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Having your own printing press is pretty cool. Uh, pretty the one cool. thing that might stick with me out of this conversation, to be honest, is what you said a second ago, that there's a monetary incentive for hash rate in Texas to support the monetary freedom of someone in Argentina or someone in the third world country, uh, economically disadvantaged region uh, that because of government choices. But because of the free market in Texas, free market in other places are supporting Bitcoin mining, that person in the disadvantaged region is getting access to fair money. Uh, so I think it's definitely a, a takeaway for me from this conversation. Steve, yeah, well, I want to thank you so much for, for joining us on the podcast. Really appreciate your perspective. Thanks for having me on. Well, this has been great. And I'll look forward to meeting you in person in Houston.